Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And uh, today is the 12th of June, 2024, as I'm recording this. And what I would like to talk about today is um, the recent plight of Nigel Farage, amongst a few other things as well, right? Now, there was once a time when I thought I didn't like the man. And of course, you know, when someone is part of the political elite, whether they're on one side or the other, it's very easy for us to say that they're controlled opposition. But I've decided that I honestly don't know. I really don't. And um, I don't want to go too much down conspiranoid paths anymore because I'm seeing what looks like real um, political revolution happening in Britain, not just Britain, but in Europe and in America at the moment. And it's very interesting to see the direction it's going in and what the mainstream media is telling you. Now, one thing I do know, and one thing I will absolutely, you know, I'm absolutely certain about, is that you cannot trust the mainstream media in the UK or in America at all. They are basically nothing more than a propaganda arm of what is now, you could call American Marxism. I was thinking woke ain't the right word, but um, American Marxism is definitely the right word for it, because that's what's happening, you know? And if you don't, if you're not a full card-carrying member of the what used to be called the woke arati um, you are now far right and um, well just to put this into perspective for you right you know the political compass test you've probably seen that before right um, here's a blank of the political compass test I'll show you a picture of it now as you can see it, it's broken into four quadrants it's not just about left and right it's also about libertarian and authoritarian as well now, um, I've done this test many times, and the reason why I've done this test many times is because um, my understanding of things changes over time, and day to day, week to week, you know, month to month, I might um, answer the questions a little bit differently. So, um, I've basically put a circle here, so have a look at this. This basically is the area that I find myself in. Always in the middle of the libertarian quadrant, um, you know, a good safe distance away from the authoritarian side of it. And kind of like in the centre left, occasionally I've been to the centre right, but mostly I've been in the left quadrant. But according to this, I'm, I would basically consider myself, according to uh, this compass, as a libertarian centrist, right? Who may be a hair's breadth to the left, but not so much that really the left or right thing even matters to me, right? That's basically where it tells me I am. But uh, according to how much the Overton window has changed, this is where it would place me now. Yes, you see, because that's what's happened. If you don't buy hook, line and sinker into the full-on Wokerati narrative, you're far right. And that's basically what they would say. But the good thing about the political compass test, and I suggest you all do it, look it up, answer the questions as best you can. If you don't understand any of the questions, research the questions and then answer them, you know, and, um, or think about it. And then, um, you know, you get a choice of agree or disagree or strongly agree, strongly disagree. And, um, and it's quite comprehensive. It's based on the old legacy political um, testing. So um, the traditional um, 20th century understanding of what makes you left and right, what makes you libertarian, what makes you authoritarian. It's not based on the sort of post Overton window shifting of the age that we find ourselves in at the moment. And um, it will give you an idea of where you are. And, um, you know, but as I say, if, if I show you where I really am, compare it to where the Wokies would say I am these days, it puts it into perspective. So, um, this is uh, something I first, I have to point this out because I think it's really important. And, um, you know, secondly, because of how much um, political distortion has been going on recently, um, we do need to talk about this. Now, over the years, I would say that I probably shifted away from the left a little bit. I wouldn't say that the way I look at the world has changed drastically. I wouldn't say that I had an awakening and then it suddenly changed me into someone else, no. What happened was, I think as I got older, I just got less angry and less resentful about other people. And I decided really what I needed to do was um, to calm down a little bit and have a re-evaluation of everything that I think I am. And of course, I suppose the reason why um, I might have been more angry and more resentful in the years was because I was trapped in a false paradigm, a false dichotomy paradigm. And that was mainstream versus alternative. 
One of the things I didn't realise, of course, and I do understand this now, that a lot of the alternative scenes that I've been in, I've been surrounded by people who were politically completely different to me, you know? As well as being from a different social class, I found myself not being surrounded by enough working class people when I was in that um, so-called alternative scenes or the different types of alternative scenes that I found over the years. And I also realised that, um, you know, a lot of the time I'd be around all these people and they were, I would honestly say, a little bit more um, communist than me as well. <coughs> they hated the system that we were in, but they didn't understand the system that we were in enough to realise that their political model, based on their hatred, was actually a distortion, was not actually really what things were all about. And I've had to think my way through all this as time has gone on. And now I realise that, um, you know, yeah, I suppose to these people I might be further to the right than I actually am because their model is distorted. And when you have a distorted model and then you see what happens over the years, you know, the UK, and I can talk about the UK because it's a place I do understand, but it, the same goes for America, probably started there actually, and the same goes for a lot of European countries, is that the, um, the ruling elites are different to the way they used to be. If you go back to the 1970s in, um, say, in the UK, you see these Monty Python sketches where they're always taking the piss out of the establishment type people, but the establishment people are all these um, silly upper class people wearing bowler hats, right? That's uh, what they are. And um, the thing is that those people don't exist now, they're just not about anymore. And what sort of um, people do you have now at the top? It's these kind of bourgeois bohemian types now who run everything. And one of the things that I kind of realised was that despite the fact that, you know, I consider myself to be, because I used to go to a lot of parties, I used to go to psytrance parties, and then before then I was in a crusty hippie thing, and then I was a goth, goth, right? And, um, you know, I was just looking for, but the level of alternative to mainstream that I was looking for was based on a much more shallow premise than um, really I, I should have done. And I kind of understand that and get that now, you know, this is the thing. So, uh, I find myself in a situation today where I realised that, yeah, I never really liked the, the bourgeois bohemians, the, the people who were, you know, pretending to be hippies but were clearly middle class. I felt I couldn't relate to them. When I was living in London, there was a bunch of them there. And um, as I think back in hindsight, I see how they've now taken over the, um, you know, the political e elites and become the establishment. And then I see how the so-called counterculture, the counterculture as it was, the legacy counterculture, the counterculture of the 1960s and beyond, has become the establishment too. They still think that they are the counterculture. So, you know, I got sick of the fact that I didn't really want to go to protests because I got sick to death of seeing socialist worker at all the protests. And I instinctively knew I didn't like the Reds, I didn't like the Commies, I just knew that they were bad. I also, you know, at the same time, didn't like the real fascists because, I mean, we know that, we know that they're not good either. But how the hell did it get to the point where the Overton window had shifted so much that the people who just obviously know, you know, but there's certain things that we do know, you know, common decency is a very important thing. Uh, take people as you find them. Doesn't matter what colour they are, doesn't matter what gender, doesn't matter what um, sexual orientation they are. As long as they're good people, and as long as they're not, um, you know, how can I say, breaching certain very sacred protocols of common decency, there's no reason to, to hate groups of people, because if you're an individualist, then you take individual people as you find them. And then, you know, like I say, there's left, there's right, there's libertarian, there's authoritarian, but there's also individualist and collectivist. And my problem at the moment is, that all the people who are, you know, protesting for, like, Just Stop Oil, or the Wokey protests, or the Antifa protests, and dare I say it, even the people who are protesting against Nigel Farage these days, they all show signs of collectivism, identity groups, all this sort of stuff, you know? Like, uh, it's just an updated, reiteration version of the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. And no matter how countercultural they think they are, no matter how alternative they might think they are, they are doing the bidding of the establishment more than anyone else. This really bad establishment that Europe finds itself with, which is based on globalism, 
and um, collectivism. It's definitely based on collectivism. It's like communism. It's like a, a new form of communism. And I think it's clear for a lot of people who've got more than two brain cells in their head can understand this. Um, one of the reasons why, as I said in the last video, I like being out here in the Philippines is that I haven't seen a single rainbow on anything, any time in the month of June. <clears throat> 12 days into it, I'm still yet to see my first rainbow on everything, right? Can't we just be quietly accepting of other people and their differences? Can't we just quietly say, well, I've got nothing against anyone on an individual basis, you know? Can we not just say that? Including gay people as well, whatever, right? Can we not just say that? And think, well, I don't really particularly want to wear rainbows. I also think that my concern about the Pride Month is that it is a collectivist thing. It is an anti-heterosexual collectivist um, hive mind. That I have a problem with because, you know, I, as an individual, meeting other individuals, I don't care about stuff like that. Let them be whatever they want to be. Just don't do it to me. And fair enough, eh? That's understandable, right? And so um, I'm not out of my way to incite hatred to any groups of people based on anything. Uh, any of their, what you call it, characteristics. This whole thing about protected characteristics that we have to have. There's one protected group of people. There's a whole bunch of protected, marginalised groups of people. And then there's... Uh, Cool. people like me who are not <laughs> you know because being white being male being heterosexual um, we uh, we don't count you see so I look at that world and I think well you know that world has left me it's betrayed me it's thrown me out it's cast me out why do I want to be in it and so I just got away from it but as I've got away from it I actually realized that my heart very much is with a lot of the people who do want to save Western culture I don't really want to be there. I don't want to have to deal with any of that shit anymore myself. Um, but as I say, I'm kind of in spirit united with a lot of the people who wish to stay and fight uh, to, to actually get the culture back the way it was and to stop this horrible, insidious nastiness that has taken over our culture um, in the Western world. And so this is uh, why I want to get onto the subject of Nigel Farage. There was once a time where I used to think I didn't like him. I used to think I didn't like UKIP. I was convinced that they were a right, right wing, probably racist or something like that. Over the years, I've actually come to realise, and I've seen him in so many different interviews with so many people, and I don't know, because no one can really truly know, but he seems a lot more human to me than all of the other politicians. And now he's a, uh, got a chance to win a seat, and when he, you know, I think he will win that seat, and then he'll be in Parliament. And of course, you know, like I say, I'm not particularly a fan of George Galloway, but the idea of having Nigel Farage and George Galloway as two renegade old school politicians, one on the left, one on the right, in Parliament during a time, very much heavyweights, during a time when pretty much most of them are just a bunch of uh, bland NPC speak you wait machine type politicians, is going to be very interesting to see what will happen. Also, that last um, rally that happened where the English Patriots got together and um, they were on their best behaviour in London and people, and then the press tried to say they're all far right and all that and they're all Nazis, but yet there was no violence and everyone was good. There might have been the old people chanting the old inappropriate thing, but um, that was exaggerated out of all proportion. And then when they left Westminster, they left it as clean as whence they came. There was no litter anywhere. This is something that they don't tell you as well. And, um, you know, so you've got all these people, some of whom have got uh, baggage associated with them, some of whom have been considered to be controversial, like Tommy Robinson or whatever, right? But the fact is that they have all come together. A lot of these people who are, I kind of think are just kind of like political centrists. They're people who want to preserve the culture that they have. They're people who want to preserve the traditions that they have. They're all getting together and, um, you know, like Sikhs turned up, people of colour turned up. And um, they said to them, it's nice to see you here supporting us. They weren't racist against them. That, of course, the mainstream media will not tell you as well. I kind of felt that, like, yeah, this is actually a really good thing. Because, um, you know, the only, the only counterpoise to this is woke left rubbish. And it has been for a long time. And it is something that has to be challenged. It has to be stood up against. Because our culture is going to the dogs, going so much to the dogs that some of us don't want to be there anymore, right? That's the thing. Here I am in the Philippines, and um, one of the things I like about being here in the Philippines is that no one is racist to me. They all like um, Westerners here, you know? 
It's also very much a homogenous culture, and so I'm a very, very tiny minority. Um, the families that you uh, have here are very much more cohesive, they're very much more together. Um, it's not a fragmented, atomized society. And sometimes, yeah, like, you know, well, I'm with Angela, and, um, like, you know, recently, um, the Arthur family have been visiting and staying at the house, and sometimes I kind of feel a little bit out of place or detached or whatever. Um, I don't mind that so much because, um, you know, the sort of the cohesion that they all have with each other is really good. And it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling to be in a culture that is as cohesive as that. I like that. And um, I hope they keep it. I hope that it's not threatened. And I, I really would like to see England like that again. But again, I don't know. The way things are going now, it has become so damaged, right, that it's very difficult to see that it would ever become like that. But there are enough people in there that wish to stay and fight for it. Now, you know, there are two different, um, how could I say, schools of thought when it comes to that. Those who think the anywhere, the anywhere view, and not all anywheres are wokey lefties, there is one bloke, nomad capitalist, Andrew Henderson. I do watch his videos because I like his take on things, and he says about um, getting, you know, people with money getting, uh, you know, multiple citizenships and stuff like that, and living and going where you're treated best and all of that, and why should you have to have an allegiance to one country and that one country let you down? And he is, um, like I say, uh, an atypical anywhere. He's not a globalist type, you know, at all. And, of course, you know, he also uh, he's quite neutral when it comes to the whole left-right political thing. But he's not, you know, he says, well, if your country betrays you, why do you owe your allegiance? And I can understand him saying that too. And he's saying, well, why bother to stay and fight? There's so many places you can go to that are emerging in the world, and I do understand that as well. But I also get, on the other side of it, You've got people like uh, Paul Thorpe, who um, you know has become an English patriot. Uh, you should look at his channel. He's an ex-watch dealer. Well, I think he still is in that business, but he now has become a full-time YouTube activist. And he's very much an English patriot, grew up in London. Um, and so he's very much a stayer and fighter. But the thing is that uh, I don't think that these two mentalities should be at odds with each other. You know, yeah, some people should get out if that's what they want to do and some people should stay and fight if that's what they want to do as well. But I do find that despite the fact that um, I can't see myself going back there, uh, my heart is still there in some way or other. And it's when I look at pictures of the English countryside, and occasionally I like to dig out my old photos of the English countryside and look at the lovely places there, the, the sacred ancient places there that I've been to. And if I could spend a lot of time there, I would do. But then I have to go through the towns and cities and I don't like it there anymore in the towns and cities of England. Seeing how it's just gone to shit. Seeing how it's become very difficult to be there at all now, you know. And for all the people who are staying and fighting, I would like to see them change things. So as we go into this future, what I find very interesting about Europe and uh, America is that America will probably end up with Trump again. That will be interesting. It will be entertaining, that's for sure, right? Um, Europe now is kind of leaning a bit to the right. I don't personally think that it's leaning to the far right. I think what you're having is, is centrists and moderate right people, maybe the odd couple of bad apples that are to the far right, but I don't think that's very significant myself personally, right? But um, the trouble is that a lot of people in Europe have now come to the conclusion that they don't like what the globalists are doing to Europe. Um, because, I mean, you know, Ireland's a good example there, actually. Ireland has been flooded. And Ireland has only got, what, a tenth of the population of the UK, right? Uh, so it's very easy for Ireland to lose its cultural identity, lose its heritage, lose what it is, and maybe eventually even lose its accent. That could happen very quickly in a place like Ireland. And then, you know, Sinn Féin, who used to be the political um, wing of the IRA at one point, used to be... Uh, used to be like really sort of pro-nationalist Irish at one point, have now become wokies. It just seems to have affected it all. And um, what the hell has happened? It's absolutely disastrous. Now with all of these um, countries now shifting more to the political right, the UK is going to be an outlier in all this because the UK is going to end up with Labour and Keir Starmer. And the UK is going to be um, kind of finding itself the only place, probably down to the first past the post system, as, a pro as opposed to the proportional representational system. And then you can have people like um, Marine Le Pen, Geert Wilders, um, Georgia Maloney, um, Viktor Orban, of course, he's been there for a while in Hungary, 
And then, of course, I think the AFD are probably going to do quite well in Germany as well. And, you know, I've seen videos of uh, Christine Anderson. She seems quite human to me. She says a lot of what I actually think. She's very much against the globalists. And yet they're trying to make them out to be a far right party. They're trying to make her out to be Hitler. You know, now, Germany, of course, had the stigma of having the Nazis and therefore having to go through this overcorrection. But now this overcorrection in Germany is very detrimental to it. That's the problem that Germany faces right now. And then, of course, recently when Nigel Farage has been going around, he had uh, someone throw a milkshake at him. He had some bloke throw some uh, debris, rocks, uh, coffee cup, building material at him. Uh, the police apprehended this bloke very quickly. <laughs> thing is that political violence to your opponents is not, you know, and trying to justify it by saying that they're all Nazis while behaving like Nazis is a real problem now that um, it seems that has been had in a lot of European countries. You know, this has happened before. You know, if you want to say that, like, we don't want totalitarianism, we don't want fascism, or we don't want communism, but we don't want oppressive regimes to come into our countries and to take us over, then how do you deal with that? You deal with that by being exemplars. You deal with that by, by demonstrating that you like freedom, you like individualism, and that you even give your adversaries a chance to talk and you have conversations with them. You honour freedom of speech for everyone, including your adversaries, and then if uh, their arguments don't stand up to scrutiny, well, basically, they did that with Nick Griffin, right? Nick Griffin, who used to be uh, the, the BNP, um, which is a proper hardline right racist um, party in the UK, they invited Nick Griffin onto Question Time once, and he, you know, they invited him to speak. They invited him to uh, speak freely, and he, basically, his reputation was down the toilet after that. So that's how you deal with that, you know? You don't um, go around throwing rocks at people, throwing milkshakes in people's faces. Now, do you not know that? Do they not know that the next thing he's going to get in his face is acid? You see, this is the problem. If political violence becomes normalised and the culture becomes destabilised and we don't do these things in a civilised way, then how can anyone say at all? How can anyone say that we're pro freedom, that we're anti fascism, when we find that we've got a lot of people going around behaving like fascists? And that's the problem, of course, that the UK is going to have. But it will be interesting to see what this next parliament will be like, because Keir Starmer will be on the receiving end of some, you know, how can I say, some interesting characters in the next parliament. And they'll have, um, they'll have one of the heavyweights in there as well, in the form of Nigel. Now, as I say, love him or loathe him, that's entirely up to you. I haven't made up my own mind entirely about him, Oh, incidentally, check out the view behind me. I found somewhere nice to walk today. Um, getting to know the countryside a little bit better um, as I'm staying in this, on this uh, tiny island that I am, off, uh, that's just off the coast of a slightly bigger one. And uh, you know, there's not enough countryside. I, I have to go out and look for it. Today I seem to have found quite a lot, so I'm happy with that. But yes, anyway, back to what I was saying, right? It will be interesting. The problem is, of course, is that I kind of fear that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, hope not hate, momentum, and all those hardline communists that are going to have some power and influence in this um, uh, parliament coming up um, is actually going to be really bad for the UK. I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, you know, uh, phew, you know, if uh, it, I think there's going to be more censorship, I think a lot of voices are going to be silenced, I think a lot of people are going to be criminalised, but the fight back will be interesting. That's the thing. And they will be scrutinised and they will be held to account in, um, in a way that hasn't happened before. And the next five years are very crucial, I think, in the UK, right? Because I think enough people understand this now. Once upon a time, we had a far-right problem. 
I don't think we have the far right problem that we do that we did once upon a time. I think we've got from the religious zealotry, um, which comes from the more extreme political end of stuff that comes out in the Middle East, should I say, to be diplomatic. I would also say that we've got a real serious far left problem as well, um, which of course, because we haven't got a history of how bad the far left is in the Western world, I think a lot of people don't actually grasp the severity of it. Yes, we have a history of a far right problem, but you know, when a bunch of people, excuse me, there, an insect just landed on my hand and I've got to be very careful about the insects out here, right? <laughs> you don't know, do you? You know, this is the tropics, it can be a little bit dangerous, right? I'm sticking strictly to the paths here as well because there's snakes too, right? Mm -hmm. Are stupid but brave. Well, you got to see the funny side. Anyway, so where was I? That's it. Um, yeah, we haven't got the problem with the far right that they're telling us that uh, we have in the UK. I don't see it. The working class people who are not buying into the wokey stuff have become very tolerant. They become much more informed. They become better educated about stuff than they used to be. They've lost their anti-intellectualism that they used to have back in the day where, you know, Back in the day, the old working classes would say, oh, you swung the dictionary, if you, if you used a big word on them. They're now becoming more learned, and they're now becoming much more uh, nuanced in the way that they think because the political establishment, the bourgeois bohemians who replaced the old bowler hat wearing old boy network have become more anti-intellectual than they used to be. And so, you know, there's a sort of flippening and inversion of everything that's going on. And, um, but, you know, the, what is being projected onto us is that like we're still living in the 20th century, still living in sort of legacy times. We have the problem, as I say, of a certain religion. We have the problem of a quasi-religion, i.e. that has come out of American Marxism that brought us things like Black Lives Matter, brought us things like the, the rainbow issue, uh, that, brought, that is kind of bringing us things like the green issue, like Just Stop Oil and um, Extinction Rebellion and all of that. Um, and the truth of the matter is that, you know, the culture, if it's going to heal itself, people have to stop being polarised, they have to stop being at each other's throats. And this stupid distortion or delusion that people are far right because they don't buy into the woke thing hook, line and sinker is really, really daft. Because, I mean, you know, anyone who's using their own brain and using their own discernment can see I am nothing like those old skinheads that we had in the day. I'm nothing like those flipping jackboot wearing, goose step stepping, funny moustache wearing people that you would have had in the 1940s in Germany. Absolutely nothing like them. And I'm nothing like the Klu Klux Klan either, right? I have no time for any of that. <laughs> but collectivism, authoritarianism um, has many forms, right? And that's the thing. It has the far left, it has the far right. I have no time for any of that. I only have time for people who are reasonably close to the political centre, who are pro-individualist, who are tolerant enough to um, allow other people to model their own ideologies, but know to draw a line and to say, right, your, your freedom stop at mine, that's the line, that's where you stop, right? And that's how it works. Your freedom stops at mine, my freedom stops at yours, you know? And um, respect and common decency, therefore, has to kick in at that point. And I think a lot of people really don't understand that. I think, uh, in a way, the world has become really childish, really politically immature and stupid. And, well, I wish the UK luck. I say that, I do. And for all the people who are staying and fighting, for all the people who are in a position to say, right, we're going to stand up to this, I, um, as well, not just in the UK, but France, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, you know, all those countries, and America too. America is very important in all of this, right? <laughs> now there'd be people out there that say they don't like Donald Trump, and there'd be people out there that say they don't like Nigel Farage, and like I say, like or dislike whoever you want. There'll also be people out there that are saying, oh, this is all an illusion and you're being taken in by it. Oh, um, because they're really, really conspiranoid, right? And, and we're not even living in a real world. It's the Matrix or whatever, right? Well, you're entitled to that opinion, if that's what you want. But as I say, 
you know, there are some seismic changes coming up now and this is history in the making. It would be very interesting to see how it turns out. And I do hope, right, that the tide will start to turn because I think enough people out there now understand this. They understand that all these virtue signaling bloody, I don't know, so-called tolerant people that we have out there are not what they say they are. They're actually a bunch of scum. They're the scum, de la scum. And I think that they will show their true colours because they are losing the narrative. And once they lose the narrative, what they got? Political violence is all they got left. And that's what they'll do. And, um, you know, there's all this uh, talk about Yuri Bezmanov, who came over, the ex-KGB um, agent who um, defected, who came over. There's a lot of talk about what he said about, you know, first they'll uh, de de demoralise the culture and then they'll bring um, crisis and they'll bring normalisation. Was it? Norm, was it demoralization uh, destabilization crisis normalization as part of trying to socially engineer the totalitarian regime into place over many generations and yes they will try to do this and yeah they've got a lot of the youngsters these days and that's the thing and maybe labor will make that worse if they decide to reduce the voting age to 16 but at the same time there is information available now that wasn't available before and um, because of the internet, for, you know, let's hope we don't get too censored. And as a result of that, there is a chance that this could all be turned around. And uh, enough people will say enough is enough. We're far more informed than our forefathers were. We know this knowledge now and we ain't standing for it. And that it will be reversed. And if it gets reversed, this will uh, set a precedent in history, will it not? So I hope to see that too. And as I say, there's always a part of me that remains optimistic even if sometimes my optimism wanes. So I'll leave it at that then. See you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.